Tonight, we are proud to feature the, as far as I can tell, the culmination of the Nexus trilogy. Although mm -hmm. authors have known to lie about that to me. This is John. I got, I got uh, Brent Weiss to squirm a couple years ago. I said, he's here for book two. It's trilogy. And Brent's like, okay, it's going to be four books. <laughs> so, but he admitted that four was done. Oh, look, it's better light. Uh, got to meet Mez a couple years ago when Nexus came out and kind of literally blew my mind as well as the people in the book. Uh, interesting, it's hard to describe the fusion of what I used to think was nanotechnology and biology and hardware and all that inside of humans and what it's done to people in the trilogy. And I assume most of you haven't read this and at least theoretically haven't because theoretically isn't on sale yet. <laughs> um, nothing makes a book seller crazier than having the publisher send you a note saying, hey, by the way, we've changed the pub date. Like, what? I had already set up the event, and they're like, yeah, but, but, but. It's like, well, I guess we'll let you out early. You can still do that on the 8th. I'm like, thank God, because we already booked the rest of it. And then, you know, author goes, what do you mean you're not doing my event? And after I basically nagged me until she said, fine, fine, I'll come. You <laughs> <laughs> know, you know, this is less you don't give it the answer I want. You don't reply to my questions. I'll just ask you again. And these days, it's like, well, I can text you, and I can call your cell, and I can leave you an email and a voicemail. They mail you a letter if I'm desperate, I guess. Um, but I will usually hound you until you either say, shut up and go away, or do what I want. So thankfully, my husband said, fine, fine, we'll do it, we'll do it. So uh, without further ado, please welcome Rezna. All right, well, well, you can tell the height differential here. <laughs> Uh, Dwayne is a hustler, by the way, because he's not kidding about he wanted this event here. He's like, you're going to launch your book at my store, not any other bookstore that might exist in Seattle. And he does not take no for an answer. So <laughs> the next time you need someone to really do something, whether they want to or not, you stick Dwayne on them. Uh, and thanks to my publisher for getting the books here early. The book is not on sale in print until Tuesday, except here in this one store, actually. So thanks very much for coming out. Uh, I see friends here with their kids. Uh, friends that left their kids at home, which is both our, our challenges, and people that are indoors on a sunny day in Seattle. So that's actually, that means a lot to me. I, I can tell that, that you guys like me. Uh, we have new covers for Nexus and Crux that you might have seen, and now the whole kit and caboodle. Uh, I'm going to talk for a little while. We'll sign books. They're selling books around the corner. I'll be signing over there. And then we're going to go to the district lounge, which is a couple blocks away for uh, drinks or appetizers, whatever you want. And everyone is welcome, whether you know me already uh, or not. Now, I, I do have to start, unfortunately, by dispelling a rumor. And I'm sorry to spend any time on this whatsoever. I'll dispel two rumors. First, there is not going to be a fourth Nexus book. If you, once you read Apex, you'll understand why. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but second, more importantly, and I'm really sorry, but this is very personal to me, I am not Samuel L. Jackson. <laughs> uh, we're both very tall, like Dwayne, or maybe one of us is rich, handsome, uh, but uh, I do not run S.H.I.E.L.D., okay. no, matter what, no matter what anyone says. Yeah. How many of you here have seen me give a talk about Nexus or neuroscience or so on before? How many here have not? A good number. All right, so we're going to go through some of this stuff. Um, before we get into the really big stuff, though, I need to give some thanks. Because they say writing is a solitary activity uh, where you just kind of sit by yourself and it's all super lonely and depressing and so on. And it's not like there aren't some days like that. But this has been an amazing process for me, all three of these books, because so many people have been part of helping me write them effectively, part of my community and giving feedback. and. They make up a, a good chunk of the people here. So thank you to a lot of people. Thank you to my girlfriend, Molly Nixon, who listens every night when I'm writing <laughs> the stories. And if I, if I do something evil to a character in the book, and you're like, man, that was really mean, it was probably Molly's idea. <laughs> if the execution isn't good, that's my fault. But uh, the inspiration often comes from her. But it's not just Molly. There's uh, like 55 people that uh, have given feedback on various drafts. Of, this is just the list for Apex. I'm sorry, I didn't merge it with the list from Nexus and Crux, which would make it slightly larger. So I hope I didn't miss anyone here. But all of these people have been beta readers uh, for the book, which is incredible. It just keeps you a little bit sane to have someone say, 
Uh, no, that part sucked. It actually is a, a really good gift to someone. Uh, it helps you know what you need to work on and what you don't need to work on. There's even a few people on this list uh, who I have never met. Uh, I put out a call, a lot of Apex happens in China, and so I put out a call on, I've traveled in China, I've never lived there, so I put out a call online for, hey, who reads science fiction, might have read Nexus already, and has lived in China and would give feedback. There's a handful of people who just said, that sounds like fun, I'll read your draft. Uh, so thank you everyone here and for everyone who's came and everyone who's helped in the book. Right. Um, the job of a science fiction writer, is it to predict the future? No. So this is, I'm stealing this uh, from something that Cory Doctor said when he was in town speaking with Neil Stevenson for the Heroglyph launch. And I think he stole this from uh, one of the top science fiction editors, actually. But the job of sci-fi is not really to predict the future, it's to provoke our thoughts about what might be and try to get us to be ready for some things, perhaps, maybe to head off some things. So the, the analogy that Corey used was that the job of sci-fi is to take a swab of sort of the, the bacterial culture growing in society and try to isolate some of those strains and grow them and see uh, what happens, how far can we grow them, what does that turn into down the road. Or uh, a quoting one of the great science fiction editors, said, uh, the job of a science fiction writer is to be in the 1950s and see the automobile becoming a big thing and see uh, movies becoming a big thing and predict not just the drive-in theater, which is the collision of those two, but take it one step further, one step into the implausible and say, this is gonna bring on a sexual revolution, <laughs> right? And it's funny, but this is the, this is the, the real stuff that's the non-obvious stuff. So uh, today I'm gonna I'll talk about some of the science behind Nexus and then some of the things that I see happening in the world that make me think that I'm actually way too conservative in some of the things that I talk about in Nexus in various ways. Most of the view of the science fiction today is outer space, and outer space has been a great sort of lab to talk about social change and so on, but I think the biggest changes really are happening uh, in inner space, in, or inter space, the space between people, if you will, and that's what I've been obsessed with in my fiction, that it's not just outer space, it's, it's inner space. And there's some reasons that I think that's uh, a big deal. This is the M83 galaxy. This is a galaxy, the hub, image from Hubble. It's a, a couple million light years away, and it's, this is gorgeous, right? This is spectacular. I, I can watch like space image porn all day long, basically. <laughs> Uh, there's about 100 billion stars in this galaxy, right? Spectacular, spectacular phenomenon. There's about 100 billion neurons in your brain. 100 trillion synapses, 100 trillion connections between neurons in your brain. The human brain is actually more complex than a galaxy. Right? This, this is actually, what we have right here is the most complex object we've ever encountered in the universe. And uh, there's a, a book, maybe 20 years old, called The Three Pound Universe that makes this point really well that almost everything we care about actually takes place inside of our brains. All the, the bad things that happen to us, all the good things that, that we produce and so on. Now I, well, I'll get to some other ideas longer. Um, but I wanna talk a little bit about the science that inspired me to write first some of the chapters in More Than Human and then uh, the science that's in Nexus. Because this idea that you can swallow a drug that connects you to people, that is science fiction, but it's kind of based on some, some real plausible stuff. And those of you who have seen me give a talk before, you will have seen a whole bunch of this, uh, but I'm gonna go relatively uh, quick through some of the greatest hits in this. And that we are making strides in actually tapping into uh, the human brain, getting data into the brain. So this is a cochlear implant. It looks like a hearing aid, but it's not. People that have hearing aids have inner ear hair cells. Those vibrate to vibrations in the, in the atmosphere, in, in air. That's what sound is. And that turns into a nervous impulse. But there's a, several million people around the world that have no inner ear hair cells left. So a cochlear implant picks up sound and then turns it into electrical stimulation directly into the auditory nerve. It bypasses that whole thing of your ear working. You actually don't need an ear at all for this. It's just nervous system digital input of audio signals. And there's about 200,000 people around the world now that have cochlear implants and can only hear anything at all because of them, including this little girl hearing for the first time in her life, or this uh, six-month-old boy 
hearing his very first sounds in life. Here we go, it's coming back on. And he's back on again. See how he turns? Hi, Jonathan. Talk for a second. Hi. Hi, Jonathan. Yeah, so that's Jonathan's a cyborg. Right. Those are, that's Jonathan's first sounds he's ever heard in life. If you trawl YouTube, you can find uh, videos of people up to like age 30 having a cochlear implant fitted and hearing for the very first time in life. And somehow the brain actually adjusts to this stuff. And so, you know, I write about it as like the war on drugs, the drug war, transhumanism, posthumanism, which is all cool, fun stuff, it makes for a good story. But the, the pragmatic thing we're doing is trying to help people that otherwise would be handicapped or disadvantaged in some way. Or we've also gotten a video into the brain. A guy named Jens Nauman, uh, at age 18, he's a Canadian dude, he uh, worked on a railroad, breaking rocks. Age 18, his pickaxe went through some rock, hit some steel below it, and a sliver of steel destroys one eye. He's like, okay, I'm not gonna compromise my outdoorsy lifestyle. The next year he's out snowmobiling, has an accident, and a piece of clutch flies into the other eye and is blind in both eyes. I'm sorry, I don't mean to make you wince, except that you know my writing, so you know that I do. <laughs> um, 20 years later, he, uh, in an experiment that was probably unethical and bypassed the FDA and happened only in Portugal, uh, <laughs> was fitted with this system. This is a, a CCD camera, basically. Uh, it's primitive, it's not nearly as good as one on your cell phone, because it's 10 years old, uh, but it picked up photons in the atmosphere, turning them into electrical signals, went down that, that blue and white and red wire to a computer that he wore on his belt that at that time was like this big and now would be about the size of a quarter. And then that translated the signals into a different format, if you will, that went into this jack in the back of his skull, into V1, primary visual cortex, which is in the back of your head. Now there's a, several billion neurons in primary visual cortex there are 256 wires in this system. Uh, so you wouldn't think that could help him at all, but it gave Jens what they called uh, limited mobility vision. What does limited mobility vision look like? It's like this. I was able to very carefully drive and look from my left side to my right side, making sure I was between the row of trees on the right and the building on the left. When I got near, um, any obstruction in the front, I would see that there was an obstruction. I would also see the lack of obstructions. And then when I backed up, I would be able to um, inspect for obstructions there. It was really a nice feeling. It was really a nice feeling. Did he get a license? No, he did not get a license. He could not pass any driver's license <laughs> exam anywhere. Uh, Jens saw, he no longer has a system, he saw in a 16 pixel by 16 pixel grayscale grid. Right. You would not trade your eye for his bionic vision system, but it was a quantum leap up from zero vision, and it was sort of a proof of principle that this thing is possible, and that with better engineering and better neuroengineering, better materials in the brain, it was actually possible to digitally input video. So it's when I was reading stuff like this, this is actually about a decade old, that I said, wow, this stuff is, needs to be written about in some way. We've also gotten data out of the human brain. Right, input, output, we want both sides, we want I and O. So... You're watching the most advanced brain-machine interface in action. Kathy Hutchinson is paralyzed and unable to speak, but just by thinking she's able to control the movements of this robotic arm and drink her morning coffee. She's part of a pioneering study run by researchers at Brown University in the US. So this is now in, in FDA clinical studies, moving towards being a, a real system that you can fit people with. Uh, and uh, Kathy's actually fantastic. Those are videos of her. Because that motivation is very important and being able to control a multi-axis thing like this. The best video is when they give her a chocolate bar. And she's like, I will get this into my mouth. <laughs> like, have, have no doubt uh, whatsoever. And she succeeds. Um, and there's now about 50 or 60 people that have had a system like this. This system also, billions of neurons in the motor cortex, has 48 electrodes. So it's tiny, tiny data, but it's enough to, to let her do something. We've gotten video out of the brain without even electrodes. This is a, an experiment that was done. They put people in a non-invasive brain scanner, an fMRI, 
and they showed them videos, and then they had an algorithm that was trained on neuroscience data and had a library of video clips that were kind of fuzzed out that it could pick. Which fuzzed out video clip is most like what they're watching right now? Which frame is most like what they're watching right now? So the left side is what the person's viewing, the right side is sort of the fuzzed out clip that the algorithm picks to, uh, to match up to that. And it's far from perfect, but it, it kind of has a clue what's going on. Like you can tell what kind of thing you're looking at just by scanning your brain from the outside. Mm -hmm. And that's with no electrodes whatsoever. Improvements purely on the software side have streamlined this so that now uh, it can tell what letter of the alphabet you're looking at. If they give you like a, a dentist eye chart and you look at the letter of the alphabet, you look stare at it for long enough, just by using an fMRI and software, you're like, oh, you're looking at a C, uh, which is something. <laughs> so that's data in, data out. And then there's this other stuff of what about the function inside the brain. And it starts with the repairing. We're always motivated first by like, uh, cure people, do no harm, repair damage that has been done. Uh, who knows this movie? <laughs> Memento, very well, good. Uh, what's the name of the actor? Guy Pierce. Guy Pierce. What's the name of the character that Guy Pierce plays in Memento? It's a little bit of a spoiler. Is it? What? Ah, okay. It's been out for like 12 years. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Olivia. Lenny. Um, Lenny has. Uh, short-term memory loss, which means that he can't, he can't form new memories. He can remember things that happened beyond, before a certain point. He walks into a room and he can sort of track what's happening, but it doesn't get encoded into long-term memory. Everything is sort of washed in and within a couple of minutes it's washed out. And that's an extreme case, though cases that extreme do actually exist. They're usually not in sort of dark, twisted thriller plots, um, I think. Uh, but m there are millions of cases more mild than that. In the U.S. alone, about five billion people live with some impairment to their faculties due to traumatic brain injury, a motorcycle crash or a fall or a car crash or something. So a group at uh, University of Southern California, headed by a guy named Ted Berger, have been working on this thing. The people that have brain damage in memory, it's usually because of damage to part of their brain called the hippocampus. So this is a hippocampus chip. It's a bypass, if you will. They take a rat that has a, a lesion in its hippocampus, so it can't form new memories, and they have take, made a chip that is based just on taking slices of hippocampus brain tissue and creating the same circuitry electronically. And they say, let's put it in place of the damaged brain tissue, and will it work? And yes, it actually it does work. These rats, who could no longer learn new things, suddenly can learn new things. They can learn to run a maze and remember it. They can learn better than the previous rats. Mm -hmm. And they get some new features. One of those new features is rats live about two years, maybe three years at most in the lab. You can take one of these rats, you can have it run a maze, you can record the session that goes through this chip. And then a year later, you can play back that session and put the rat in the maze, and the rat will run the maze like it just ran it five minutes ago, not like it's been half of its lifetime. Ago, which might be a handy ability, from, not for maze running necessarily, but for, <laughs> for other sorts of memories that some of us uh, might want to stare. Um, How many connections on that? Uh, it's not many, it's hundreds, actually. Or there's these guys. These are rhesus monkeys. They've been trained on a monkey IQ test. It's called a pick and match test. They're shown some, some images, and then later on they get another uh, large, fast, like high-speed stream of images, and they pick just the ones that they saw before, and not the bad ones. This is considered a, a pretty daunting task. Actually, it's a pretty hard test for humans to take. So then the monkeys have a chip put in their brain, in their prefrontal, prefrontal cortex, the part of the cortex involved with pattern matching and decision making and so on, that monitors what's happening as they take this test, and it gets some outside input, which is, do they get the answer right or wrong? And it starts to learn what a uh, neural connection looks like, what real-time neural activity looks like when the monkey's about to get a right answer versus a wrong answer. Then the chip can be flipped into an active switch, active state, where it can intervene. So they take some of the monkeys and they try to impair their performance on the test, to knock down the performance, to simulate brain damage and see if they can fix it. 
They do this by giving the monkeys large doses of cocaine. <laughs> so those monkeys think their performance in the test is climbing, but really it's, it's plummeting. <laughs> then they flip the switch on the system, and the, the chip repairs all of the loss for those monkeys that were given cocaine. And in monkeys that aren't dosed, the chip raises their performance on a 1 to 100 scale of a test by about 10 points on this test. I don't want to overstate this. You do a lot more in your daily life than like picking pictures out of a list. Uh, but on, for picking pictures out of a list, man, we've got a solution for you. <laughs> as long as we're going to have brain surgery. All right. And we've sent data between brains. Uh, at the UW, the day that Crux came out, uh, these two professors announced uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Rao and Professor Stoker. They announced their results, um, which is uh, what you see here is Rajesh Rao and Andrew Stoker are playing a video game. They're playing a video game together. They're in uh, buildings that are about a mile apart on campus, and they're not playing against each other, and they're not playing two-character cooperative mode either. They're playing a single character, single player, uh, and the way it works is uh, Rajesh Rao on the left has the screen and can see the action. It's a video game where you have to like, shoot the bad guys and not the good guys. Uh, but he has no controller. He has just the screen. Uh, Andrea Stoko across campus can't see the screen and he has the fire button. Right. And what happens is that when uh, Rajesh Rao wants to shoot, he thinks about it. He wills shooting. The EEG cap on his skull picks up the, the right pattern, notices, oh, okay, we think we want to shoot. Transmits it across campus, across the internet. Uh, and the magnetic stimulator sitting on a pedestal on Andrea Stoko's brain magnetically stimulates a particular part of his front motor, of his right motor cortex corresponding to this finger. A current then runs through that part of his brain, and Andrea Stoko's finger twitches, and he <laughs> fires. Right. So the professor on the right's finger is sort of uh, in one direction, an extension of uh, Rajesh Rao's uh, brain. And importantly, it's not that uh, Professor Stoko thinks, "Oh, Rajesh wants me to shoot now." No, it's just his finger twitches. Like, oh wow, I guess that was when we wanted to shoot. Um, another study has emailed verbal thoughts back and forth. Very, very clunky, but they can get some ideas. Or then there's this study. This is done by a guy named Miguel Nicolelis, who is probably the most famous and best funded researcher in the area of neural interfaces. And in this study, you've got two rats they put in identical cages. And the rats have a lever or it's two levers, and lights above the levers. And when the lights flash in a certain pattern, then and only then, by pressing the correct lever, they can get fed. Okay? Except that one rat has been trained on the system and knows the pattern, the other rat is sort of clueless. And it's like, what am I doing here? Like, when do I get fed? <laughs> right? um, the rats both have implants in their motor cortex, corresponding to their paws. Right? And when they, and they're connected, but the connection's been turned off, when they activate the connection and let data start flowing between the two rats, suddenly the rat that has never been trained starts pulling the right lever because of his friend. And it's not all the time, he doesn't get 100% or anything like it, but he gets substantially over chance, like 70% of the time he starts pulling the correct lever. The other interesting thing about this study is where the rats were. Because one of these rats is at uh, North Carolina Duke University, it's where uh, Nicolelis is. The other rat is in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Because once you digitize thought, it, you can send it across the internet to you know, anywhere with a certain amount of latency. Right? And you can tell that Nicolaitis is a sci-fi fan because they didn't write this paper up as uh, uh, mediated connections of uh, front paw motion in, in rats through a neuroprosthesis. They wrote this up as, we have created a meta-organism of two rats on the internet. <laughs> uh, all right, dude, yeah. I should send that guy a book. <laughs> All right. Or what if this is an experiment that has not been done? That rat uh, memory prosthesis, what if we had two rats with memory prostheses and wired those together and let data flow between them? We don't really know what would happen. We'll find out at some point down the road. It could be, uh, oh, I know Kung Fu. Um, <laughs> probably not. Probably not, but it might be, oh, I know how to run this maze, or a little bit better. All right, so for all of that, the reality, and this is the stuff that I get to have fun with in my fiction. How many here are people, how many people here have not read Nexus? Anybody? A couple of people, okay. 
Good to see you. Um, so obviously I have a lot of fun with this stuff and so on. It, all that said, I don't think we will have Nexus in 2040 when I set the book. I'm sorry to say, or if those of you who are horrified, I'm happy to tell you. It depends on hardware breakthroughs. I have a whole other set of things I could tell you about what's happening in brain hardware. And people like DARPA are really, really trying. And people have crazy ideas that maybe could prove me wrong and could get us there. But it's still, like right now, it's brain surgery. And it's how many people here are excited about voluntary brain surgery? Electric brain surgery. <laughs> Okay, we've got like, Dan, let's talk later on. I know some researchers at USC, they're looking for people. I didn't mention those, they're doing their first human implantations this year, actually. I think you have to be already brain damaged to qualify, but we can, we can, we can talk. So as I, as I write this stuff, so Apex takes place a lot uh, in, uh, a lot of protesting is happening on the streets in Apex, and that's one of the things that motivated me. You can think of the first two books, were the, the War on Drugs, the War on Terror, and I had never heard of Edward Snowden at that point, but that sort of, there's some echoes there. The third book was much more directly impacted uh, by things that I had seen happening over the past few years, because it seems like there's a whole lot more uh, protesting going on. And I love this sign. This is a sign that uh, somebody posted uh, during the Arab Spring, and uh, I think it's, it's slightly overstated. Uh, but it's not entirely overstated. If you go look at what happened in the Arab Spring, this is Tahrir Square, the way this event happened is uh, some cops uh, beat up a kid in Alexandria, Egypt, and someone recorded that with their cell phone and then put that video up on YouTube. And then some other guys, including this guy, Wael Ghanim from Google, uh, put up a Facebook event that was, we're gonna protest police brutality and linked to the YouTube video. And I think he thought maybe he'd get a couple thousand people to show up. Uh, and this is what actually did happen. Now the Arab Spring did not end in the way that any of us would have wanted it to end, but the, you can't look at this and, and not conclude that the digital tools were a big part of catalyzing what occurred. They weren't the whole of it, there were real grievances as well. Of course, you, you're probably not gonna go out in the streets unless you're pretty pissed off about something. Uh, but it wasn't really that possible or it was made much easier by the digital tools that connect us, that do connect our brains, actually, even if they're not quite implanted yet. Or you look at what's been happening in the US just recently. Like, why are, uh, why are there more protests over issues like this one, Black Lives Matter, and why are we seeing more of it? Because the ability to amplify it is so much greater. You look at something like Ferguson, and it was soaring on Twitter for two or three days, before it was covered by any national media. And you look at the things that are happening now, we have a lot of conversations about this, you can look at what we're seeing as incredibly depressing. But I actually don't, because my view is the problems that we have of police brutality, of minority disenfranchisement, of poverty, have been with us for decades. But what's happening now is that awareness of them is being pumped up by, in part, the tools that we have to connect us. And so it's no longer, this might have been uh, just a protest in Ferguson, might have been just a protest in Baltimore, but it's not. It is now something that is uh, national and international, and it has impacts. We saw that in the case of Baltimore, uh, charges were filed by uh, uh, this woman, Marilyn Mosby, I think her name is, the, the uh, DA there. She filed charges against six police officers, including murder against one of them. And I don't want to have any disrespect for, for Ms. Mosby here, but I'm not sure that would have happened without Twitter. Not because of the events right there, because of the events of the preceding year. And so this ability to connect us is actually having a, an interesting impact right now. Uh, it doesn't have to be set with just a neural interface or, or 35 or 25 years in the future. Or today the news is that the city of Newark has created a uh, civilian-led police accountability force that can impose its own punishments. Uh, and I don't think that would have happened without Twitter, to be totally honest. So this ability to link our brains is, is having some, some interesting <laughs> impacts. Now, there are many people who want to stop it. Uh, in Iran, uh, Twitter was very effective in, in some early protests, the, the Green Revolution, and then the authorities banned it. Uh, in Turkey, uh, the authorities uh, have periodically banned 
uh, Twitter and YouTube, because on YouTube you could find a video that was an audio recording of uh, Erdogan, the current prime minister, uh, talking to his sons about how to hide some of the billions of dollars they'd embezzled. And he didn't like that. He's like, well, we're just going to ban YouTube and ban Twitter. Whereas at that, for a while in Turkey, people were spray painting alternate DNS addresses on walls. So you could walk down and be like, oh, I'm cut off. I'd be like, try this one right here. I thought it was really interesting. <laughs> China is, is maybe, you could say, the most successful. They probably spend uh, more effort and money on blocking the flow of communication across borders than any other uh, nation. Arguably, the US spends more money in other ways. Uh, and we greatly outspend China on, on cyber stuff. Uh, though in a, with a slightly different emphasis. Uh, but even in China, uh, we don't really know this in the US, but in China there have been hundreds of multi-thousand person protests over the last few years. The v large majority of them over environmental issues, actually. If you include food safety, uh, water, and air pollution, uh, hundreds of them. A few about corruption, that's the other big one, but really the environment. This is a protest in uh, Qidong over a uh, waste pump, like a giant waste tunnel that was going to dump sewage basically right into their water supply. And tens of thousands of Chinese in Qidong took to the streets uh, and that project was canceled. And this is one of like a dozen projects in China in the last uh, few years that has been uh, successfully uh, canceled by environmental protest, actually. Uh, here's another one, this is a couple years ago, where like a few thousand Chinese people got together protests, like people tried to drive their cars through it and they were just like, no way. Like we, they started flipping cars and again, they managed to get a, a project that they thought was dirty and bad for their local environment, just canceled. So China is not a democracy, but it's a country that uh, knows that it has you know, 1.1 billion people who <laughs> want certain things and if they're able to self-organize, uh, the government is proving to be at least a little responsive to their, to their top concerns. And all the data says this happens uh, largely mediated by cell phones. But uh, uh, an acquaintance of mine uh, is, uh, did some research in China on how protests happen and so on, and she has great stories. It turns out that if you are going to go to a protest or there's gonna be a protest organized in your city and you're on one of the lists, you might get a text message the day before saying, oh, the protest has been canceled. Now that text message actually came from the government and everyone knows it. So everyone just ignores it, actually. Um, it, yeah, China is certainly trying to figure out uh, how, to, how to clamp down on this, but right now it's actually having an impact. In Hong Kong, the Hong Kong student protests you know, have not yet uh, succeeded, they've, they've dwindled down. But there we saw another tech breakthrough. They were using an app called FireChat, uh, produced in San Francisco by a Microsoft alum, actually, uh, that is peer-to-peer -peer encrypted communication. There's probably, the FireChat is not perfect, there's some issues with FireChat, but it allowed the protesters, even if the authorities turned off cell phone service, to keep communicating phone to phone uh, across the entire range uh, of protest. And now we see that the Chinese government has actually spent a whole lot of money on trying to get malware onto protesters' phones to try to cut them off and sort of an arms race happening in part between like a triad of Silicon Valley people, uh, digital rights activists, protesters, and a state or a few states trying to stop them. And ironically, the U.S. is one of the biggest, U.S. Um, Department of State is one of the biggest funders of software to try to circumvent uh, the nations blocking you, even as we try to clamp down on it and stop it inside the U.S., which is just a, a really, really funny thing. Oh, and then, of course, you know, I can't really talk about this at the NSA because I see tremendous positive things happening, but of course, it, fortunately for anyone who wants to write fiction, there's lots of push and pull and there's lots of uh, scenarios that I don't really love that much happening. And if you know me, if you follow my Twitter, you know that I get periodically incensed and go on a, a tweet ram rampage about <laughs> the ills of the NSA. Oh, I thought I was just talking for like five minutes so far. I go long all the time. Um, I, yeah, well, and I, I hear uh, that there will be one uh, place to buy still open even after eight o'clock. So a lot of people look at this and think, oh, we're getting to Big Brother when you look at what's happening with the NSA and so on. Um, but despite that, like Big Brother was a story of societal control, but what, conversely, there was all this liberalization happening in America. 
I mean, we live in the future. We live in science fiction right now. I became very aware of that in 2012 uh, during the last election. You know, Barack Obama won, but it was the referendums that really changed things for me because suddenly we lived in a future where it was legal to get married if you were gay. Like a lot of states passed that. And in two states, it was legal to, to smoke marijuana. And most sci-fi missed that, I would say. And that's societal change. And it's societal change uh, that has sort of swept. Like now, more than two thirds of Americans uh, live in states where marriage equality is legal. The Supreme Court, the arguments are happened last week. The court's probably gonna strike down DOMA. And it's not, the court does not exist in a vacuum. It's probably going to strike down DOMA, not just in the merits of the law, but because the justices kind of know that which way the wind is blowing, and some of them don't want to be, at least enough of them, one or two, don't want to be on the wrong side of history. And so they're like, I can, they read the Twitters, I mean, they don't, I'm not sure they're on Twitter, but they see the mass motion of what's happening in American culture, and they're like, it's obvious where this is going to be 10 years from now. Do I really want to go down as a no vote? on this. That's really what's going on inside some of their heads. There's a, a similar case on uh, can police look at your cell phone if they pull you over? It used to be that the police believed they could just, if they pulled you over for a speeding infraction, they could pick up your cell phone and look through all of it. That case was decided last year at the Supreme Court. 9-0 struck that down and said, no, that's completely unreasonable. That would not have happened if we were not all bitching about the NSA. <laughs> Thank you. And it, so the sign of the times, that zeitgeist happens. Here's how fast uh, gay marriage has become legal in the U.S. as a percentage of Americans. From 2012, you know, about 10% to now uh, about two-thirds in three years. That is crazy. Uh, or medical marijuana has had a, or this is full marijuana legalization, that's had a slower and more steady uh, progression. There's a great, great, great article, I told this from Business Insider, on how fast did the U.S. change on a variety of uh, legal issues. I'll send around the, the link to this. And some things have happened really very, very fast. Roe v. Wade has happened really, very fast. But most things have taken a long time. And you look at how fast marriage equality happened, and it went zero to 60, just like that. And I credit that a little bit to our increased ability to, to communicate, to be honest, to see other people, to talk to other people, to experience people a little bit different than us. And this is not just a phenomenon of the US anymore. So we went from the internet, what's that, to half of all adults at the end of this year, at the end of 2014, are on the internet, around the world, right? Three billion people. It'll probably be five billion in another two years. And realistically, in five to 10 years, it's almost everyone. It'll never be 100%, but it's over 90% of people are online. This is the fraction of people who are not connected in some way. You know, 2003, nobody had a smartphone. Uh, and now uh, it's all, pfft, everyone is getting connected in some way. And I think that has real, real societal change. Let's have. Did you ever come up with a word for when we're all connected? Yes, yeah, so I'm working on, I've got a blog post I'm going to post, I think, to I and I. And I think I'm going to use, uh, well, which one did I decide on? The singularity as a way to, <laughs> the singularity is nice and all, but you know, Ray Kurzweil says that's 2045. I know Ray, and I think he's overly optimistic. The singularity is in like five years when everyone is online with a smartphone, right? And you go out a little bit further than that, Moore's Law, 100x reduction or 100x improvement in price performance of electronics every decade, right? Uh, that happens in storage and in bandwidth, just at the same speed. So that, what that means is uh, if you try to build ENIAC, this is the right side is ENIAC, the world's first digital computer, made at my alma mater, University of Illinois, the left an iPhone 6. If you wanted to build an iPhone 6, using ENIAC technology, it would have a footprint larger than the greater Seattle area, be four or five miles tall, and would draw more electricity than California. And it still couldn't play Angry Birds. <laughs> or sext, or, I mean, there would nobody to sext too, really, because it would, it would also cost about $100 trillion. So we'd only have, that's the world GDP. So we'd have just one. <laughs> So good luck with that. Good luck at any time on, on Angry Birds and that one. Um, basically, the cost of computing and of, of communication goes to zero. Or just in the next 10 years, the cost per unit of storage and bandwidth and so on of these things will drop by 100. And so you can imagine that people everywhere around the world will have dramatically more digital capabilities 
than you are for their education, for their gaming, for their looking at porn, for their raging about things they hate online, but also for their connecting and for their communication, right? There are already more people with mobile phones in Africa than in Europe and the US combined, right? Because it's nearly universal there already. Landlines are still at about 10%, 11% in Sub-Saharan Africa. But in Kenya, 87% of adults have cell phones. Those are not smartphones right now, not most of them. Maybe 20% are smartphones. But the next five years, they'll be smartphones. And that changes a whole heck of a lot of stuff. So this is some very old school information technology. And I talk a lot about information technology being sort of liberalizing. This is a Sumerian, and this is not liberalizing. This was a tool of empire. This was not a tool of the 1%. No, they couldn't read. This is a tool of like the 1% of the 1% of the 1%. They were the ones who could afford somebody who would sit there with a chisel and write out what they wanted. I mean, it took some serious labor to do any, uh, any recording. And I don't know what this is. It's probably a ledger of what somebody owes somebody, because that's what it was originally used for. It was used to build empire and crush the little people. And it, it probably uplifted them in some way, but not out of their choice. And that changed when it got into the hands of people. This is sort of a Moore's Law thing, if you will. The cost of literacy uh, plunged by several orders of magnitude with Gutenberg. Right? And that led to lots of things. It led to Newton could collect all the ideas of all the intellectuals that he'd ever heard of on math and physics into one book that created calculus and so on. And so the, the projector that we have here, the phone and so on, all exist because of this book in some sense, which exists because of Gutenberg as well. It led to things like newspapers. The first newspapers appeared in the 1500s. People could actually find out what was going on around them. It led to these crazy ideas that the kings and princes would probably never have sanctioned. It was like John Locke who wrote that, hey, maybe we should be OK with people of different religions than us or different national origins. Like, that was a super weird idea. <laughs> it's caught on a couple places and still waiting for it to like really go big. <laughs> or you know, the founders just ripped off Locke, actually, and, and put that in the Bill of Rights. And it, this idea that you have civil liberties, that, that people have rights, and not just kings have rights, is this totally weird idea that's just a couple hundred years old, really. And it only exists because people could have unfettered communication with each other without having to be mediated by the guy with the chisel or the rich guy that employed him. And so my view is that uh, counter to, to this, that there are, will always be impulses to use Infotech to suppress, to surveil, and so on, that uh, mostly we're heading in the other way. And that every big step in social progress has actually been made possible by uh, more ways to communicate, more ways to see other people and know who they are, more ways for new voices to be heard, more ways to see uh, out of the eyes of others. Uh, so yeah, I guess I'm an optimist. Uh, and so thank you for letting a sci-fi author rant on about the future of society. And just thank you in general. <laughs>